Hello and welcome back to Neural Data Science. I'm Aaron Newman. Today we're going to be working with multiple data files using GitHub Copilot. In this lesson, specifically, we'll read in several files, and these files are data files. They're made up data, but they model reaction times from three individual participants in a simple cognitive psychology study. And we're going to, once we load them in, we'll compute reaction time means for each participant and also the overall mean across participants. And we will also compute 95% confidence intervals. And finally, we'll present those in a nice little table. This is a great lesson because we haven't seen how to do all of these things yet with Python. So you don't necessarily know how to do them yourself. And that's very often what you're going to encounter when you're doing your own data science coding is you know what you want to do, but you don't necessarily know how to do it. And we'll see how we can use GitHub Copilot to do this, the kind of challenges that that creates, how we're going to engineer better prompts to do that, and how we're going to debug things when GitHub Copilot gives us the wrong code. All right, so let's jump in. This is the first of three lessons in the textbook, lesson one. And here we're going to start with just reading the data files using pandas. So as I said, there's three data files. Each file contains the reaction times from 10 trials of a relatively simple task in which participants had to indicate which direction a briefly presented arrow was pointing. The reaction times are in seconds. Each file contains the RTs from a different participant. In each file, there's three columns. You can determine what those columns are by looking at the first few rows of the file, and we'll see that in a minute. In this exercise, we'll read in the data from the three files in the data directory, and they're all systematically named as s1.csv, s2.csv, and s3.csv. Once we read them in, we'll combine them into a single pandas data frame. We'll save that data frame for future use, because that's something we often do with our data files, and then we'll calculate the mean RT for each participant. All right, so let's start by reading in the data. What we want to do is write a prompt that reads files from the data folder. We know that all of the file names start with an S and end in .csv, so we can use that in writing our prompt, and then we can combine them into a single pandas data frame. Okay, so let's start writing our prompt. So let's try something like read in the files. I'm not going to specify how many files because we want to be flexible. Maybe there's more. And it guesses from the data directory. Excellent guess that, well, let's say, whose names start with, well, they don't start with data. They start with S and end in .csv. I'm going to hit enter. It's good practice to chunk your prompts but line by line into a series of steps that are the things that you want Copilot to generate the code for. And Copilot guesses that we want to concatenate those into a single data frame. Awesome. Accept that prompt, hit enter, and it suggests the files are in the data directory. Well, we kind of already said that Copilot, so we don't need to do that. And what do we want to do? We want to save them, save the data frame as a CSV file in the data directory. That is indeed what we want to do. So as soon as I typed save as a prompt, Copilot figured out what I wanted to do. All right. And then read the CSV file back in and display the first five rows. I'm going to skip that prompt because firstly, I don't need to read the file back in. I already have the data frame in memory. And we'll look at the first five rows in a later code cell. We'll keep our code cells kind of chunked and do one or two things at a time rather than a whole bunch of things in one code cell. It just makes it easier to read and easier to debug if there's any problems. So I'm going to hit enter again, giving a blank line, and that indicates to Copilot that I'm ready for it to start generating code. This time it knows to import pandas as pd first, which is great, even though I didn't tell it to use pandas. And it wants to import glob. Remember, glob is good for match in patterns. So when we know that all the file names start with s and end in .csv, glob is the tool that we want to use to describe those patterns. Didn't give me any more import suggested code, so I hit enter again, and now it's suggesting this line path equals r dot dot slash data. Use your path for the comment. This isn't actually right. You might not recognize that, but the dot dot slash means to go up one folder from where we are currently and then find another folder called data. But the data folder is actually in the present directory, so that's not going to work. So I'm going to delete that line. Let's see if it comes up with other options. If I hit option and square bracket, uh, well, it's giving me the prompt again. I'm going to see if I accept this prompt, will it do any better? No. So let's go back. 
And this is kind of, you know, your normal process with Copilot. Read in the files from the data directory. Let's change this to from the folder in the current directory. Folder and directory are two words that mean the same thing. So I could have said the folder in the current folder or the directory in the current directory. Anyway, having made that change to the prompt, I'm going to go down. My imports are still good. Let's see if that's enough. Get data file names. Okay, well, that's a different prompt than I got before. And now path equals r dot slash data. So dot means the present directory, and then slash data means in the current folder. So that actually works. And now it's saying file names equal dot glob dot glob. So remember, we imported glob, so that's right. And then the path plus slash s dot csv. So our path is dot slash data, and then it'll add slash s. Remember the star is a wildcard, which matches any number of characters. So anything that starts with s and ends with dot csv, with any number and nature of, of characters in between, will get matched by that path. Okay, and it wants me to hit enter again. And so we've defined the path, we've got the file names, and now we want to read in the files from the folder whose names start with s and end in dot csv. And so it's going to start with dfs equals an empty list. Hit enter again. Remember, every time Copilot seems to be not responding, try hitting enter again. Often that'll be enough. Now it's starting a for loop for file name in file names. We've already defined file names up above here, right? Enter. All right, Copilot, give me some love. Read in the file. And here it's actually filled in a whole bunch of code all at once when I hit tab. So it wants to read in the file. So it'll read df equals pd.readcsv file name. Remember, we're looping through each of the file names we have. It says that there's no index column. That's fine. Header equals zero. That means that the header is the first line. Remember, hyphen counts from zero. And then it appends the file to a list of data frames. So we already defined dfs as an empty list up here. And as it reads in each file, it adds it to that list. And then concatenate the data frames into a single data frame. df equals pd dot concat dfs. So it's concatenate all those data frames along the first axis, which is rows. So basically that means it's going to stack the three data frames one on top of each other, which is what we want. Ignore index equals true. That's generally a good idea when you're concatenating data frames. And also note that it unindented these lines of code relative to the for loop. So this doesn't occur in the for loop. It runs the for loop, gets through all the file names, and then does this concatenation. Okay. Enter a couple of times. And remember, the last thing we need to do is save that data frame. And we want to save it to the data directory. And the function for that, or the method rather, is df2csv. And now it's getting the path right, dot slash data. And it's going to call it s underscore all. So it's seen the pattern of s is the start of all my file names. And it's just added into all. So all in all, pretty clever. I'm going to hit enter again. There's not really much else. There's nothing else that I asked it to do. It is now wanting to give me the header of the data frame. But as I said, we're going to wait and do that in a different cell. So I'm going to backspace, delete that, and shift enter to run the cell, and boom, it's done. Didn't generate any errors, so we can assume it worked correctly. Now I'm going to stop here before we go on to the next code cell and point out something that Copilot did here, which is not, I mean, it's workable code, but it's not super efficient. So we define an empty list, dfs, then we loop through file name and file names read each one and append it to the data frame and then concatenate them all together. That's workable, it, it works fine, but it's not the most efficient way to do it. We could also use a list comprehension. Let's see if we can get Copilot. We've learned about list comprehensions earlier, but let's see if Copilot can do that. So what I'm gonna do is, let's not worry about the saving part, but I'm gonna copy the first two lines of that prompt, read in the files from the folder, start with s and in csv concatenate them into a single data frame use list comprehension to do this and yeah i'm going to skip the saving part because that doesn't matter so again suggesting my imports it's a bit redundant but that's okay 
And no, it's it's getting the data names, globbing. So now you see we got the list comprehension. So we have DFs equals square bracket. So everything inside the square brackets, that's our list comprehension. So you can see we've bundled the for loop essentially inside the square brackets for file name and file names, pd.readcsv file name. So it's going to do that all and create a list. So if we scroll back up, what took us many lines of code up here, one, two, three, four lines of code, we can actually do in a single line of code. It's cleaner, more efficient. Arguably, it's a little less transparent than the for loop, but I like list comprehensions because they are efficient and take up less space in your code. Anyway, either one works. All right, so the next step here is to write a prompt to view the first five rows of the data frame that we created in the above step. So show the first five rows of the first data frame. Well, I don't want the first data frame of the, so I could say the concatenated data frame, or one thing that is good practice with your prompts is to actually use the variable names. So the variable name that we ended up with for our concatenated data frame was df. And so we're going to say first five rows of df. And it gives us df.head on that. Boom, we get the first five rows. We can see that the first five rows are wanting to participant ID S2. I'll come back to that in a minute. The second column is called trial, one, two, three, four, five. And the last column is called RT, and that has our reaction times in seconds. You might be surprised that S2 is the first participant ID in the data frame, given that the first file as described above is called S1. So logically you'd read in S1, then S2, then S3. But when Python lists files using glob and reads them in using for loops, it doesn't always do things in a systematic or alphabetical order. It'll get through them all, but the order may not be the intuitive order. That's fine. Another thing we could do before we go down to the next is if we want to kind of spot check that we got subjects other than S2 in there, we could instead of the head function, we could use the sample function or method, sorry. So to do that, we can give Copilot a prompt, like show a sample of five rows from df. And it gives me df sample with the argument five, run that. And we at least see S1, S2 in there, but not S3, but it is a random sample. So let's do that again. Now we see S3, so that's good. This kind of random spot checking isn't the most systematic way to check your data frame, but it is a quick and easy way to do it. So the next thing is we should do a more systematic check that we got the expected number of rows and the expected number of columns. So there's one way to do that, which is not tell Copilot how many rows or columns we expect, but just say show the number of rows and columns in DF guessed what I was saying. So smart. And the command for that is df.shape. Run that. And we see, remember that Python always operates in terms of rows, then columns. So we have 30 rows and three columns in df, which is what we want. The next command was a little more formal. And this is something that's good to do when you have code and you want to make sure that it's running correctly, is to build checks into your code. So we can ask Copilot to raise an error message if the number of rows, oops, rows in DF is not 30 or the number of columns in DF is not three. Oh, you're so smart. Okay. So if df shape is not equal to 30 by 3, which we just saw it is above, then it's going to raise a value error. And here we have a string. The number of rows is not 30, or the number of columns is not 3. We've never seen the raise command before, or a value error. But probably you can intuitively sense that what this will do is, if the shape isn't what we want it to be, then it will issue an error. Now if I run that cell, 
I'm not going to get any output because the shape is correct. So there is no error, but we should test our test. And so in order to do that, we want to create a data frame that doesn't have 30 rows or three columns, run that same command and see if we get an error. And if we do, at least we know that our error checking code is running correctly. Now we don't actually want to modify our data frame because we don't want to throw out data. We actually want to use all the data later on, but we can use slicing to create a subset of the whole data frame that has a smaller number of rows or columns and run the test on that. So let's write a prompt to do this. We can say, create a slice of DF with, let's suggest the first 10 rows in all columns. That'll work fine. And then I'm gonna copy my prompt from above about raising an error. Enter, okay. So it says DF slice equals DF.iloc colon 10 comma colon. So that is going to take from the first row up to the 10th row, not including, but that's since it starts at zero, that's 10 rows, comma, and then colon means in all columns. And then it gives us if, this is basically the same from above, raise the value error. Okay, run that. And, oh. I wasn't really reading what I was getting from Copilot. So here it said the shape is not equal to 10. Well, that's wrong. We want it to be 30. And that's what our prompt said. So interestingly here, even though our prompt was accurate, the code that Copilot generated was seemed to be more sensitive to the context of the code it already generated than the prompt. So again, you got to pay attention to what Copilot is giving you and be critical. Okay, so I've corrected that. I just manually corrected it to 30 in the check here and then also in the error message that it gives, run that. Now we see what the value error looks like when it gets raised and it gives us explicitly the, the output. So that's great. In a previous version, I guess it generated an assertion error rather than value error, but that's, you know, Copilot will give you different things different times but this, we can see it's actually working. Just to be systematic, we could also do the same thing for the number of columns. So let's grab that prompt, paste it down below, and say, create a slice of the DF with the first, with actually, let's say all rows, and let's just say two columns, because two is not three. Raise an error message if the number of rows is not 30, number of columns is not three see if it does any better this time. So it's going to slice the data frame Enter again. And now, yes, now it's at least using the right test of 30 and three and the same value error that we saw below, run that. And again, we get the, the error. So that's great. So there you go. That's a way of being able to test your code. And we learned something new about raising value errors and using that in debugging or error checking, I guess you could say. All right, so at last, we have our data in one data frame. Now we want to calculate the mean reaction time for each participant. All right, let's prompt Copilot. So let's see, calculate mean RT for each subject. Now, whether we say subject or participant, those terms are used pretty interchangeably in psychology. Arguably, it's more politically correct to use participant, but I won't get into that here today. And now, bizarrely, it's also wanting to raise an error message. No, we don't want to do that, Copilot. Okay, so having ditched that prompt, now the suggested code is df.groupbyparticipant.mean. Take a look at that. Think about if that's going to generate an error or not. Hint, it is. I'm going to run it anyway. There we go, okay. And it shows me the error is occurring at that df.groupby line, which is not surprising. It's the only line of code in the cell. And the error is key error participant. Okay, why is this an error? Well, I said for each participant, but if we scroll back up and look at the sample or anything where we can see the column names, our column names are participant ID, trial, and RT. So we can't refer to participant, we have to refer to participant ID. And again, this underscores why it's good practice to 
use the actual names of variables in your prompts. So I'm going to delete that code that didn't work, enter again with my new prompt, and now it's giving me group by participant ID. That's great. It actually interjected another thing in there, which is actually a good thing. That was another problem with the previous code, is that it's then selecting only the RT column to compute the mean. Otherwise, we'd get means for each column. Run that, and we get output that shows us participant ID, S1, S2, S3, and a value for each. And those look reasonable in terms of mean reaction times, given, let me just add a cell below, and we'll do df.sample5 again. You know, our RT ranges are, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, so those mean values are in line with the individual data points, which is just another good kind of check that you can do to make sure that the output you're getting is sensible. Okay, previously that generated an error. We saw that. We don't really need the code there. And hey, look at that. We're at the end of the first of the three lessons here. So if you want to take a break, you can, and we'll be back momentarily. And we're back. In this second lesson of our three-part series, we're going to be computing mean reaction times and confidence intervals. So in the previous workbook, we saw how to read in the data and compute the mean reaction times for each participant. Now we're going to compute the mean reaction time across participants, and we'll hopefully also get to confidence intervals. So first off, I've gone and copied and pasted code in here that will read our file names and create the data frame that we want and also show us a random sample of five cells. So that's already pre-supplied. Let's run that. I just save time by not generating the prompts and trying to regenerate the same code. There we go. We see our three columns, all the subjects, so we're good to go. All right, so now let's compute the mean RT across participants. And I have a suggested prompt there. Calculate the mean RT across all, and remember, even though in English we'd say participants, we want to use the variable name here, participant ID. Enter, and it gives us df square bracket rt dot mean. And it's as simple as that. That is the mean across all participants. So compared to what we did before for each participant, we had to use df dot group by, then specify rt and dot mean. We're not grouping by individual participants, but across, this works fine. All right, let's get to 95% confidence intervals. So 95% confidence intervals are used quite widely in statistics and areas like psychology and neuroscience as an estimate of the variability uh, across measurements, either just across measurements for each participant or across participants. And it's a useful tool because basically the 95% confidence interval is your best guess based on the data you have that the mean of the data is somewhere within that range of confidence interval values. So we get a mean, but if we sampled another random sample of participants, we might get a different value. And every time we do a sample, because we're sampling randomly from a larger population, we're going to get different values, and none of them are going to be exactly the true mean of the entire population. So the idea of the confidence intervals is to give us a sense of like what's the possible range of values given the data we have. Now those CIs will change based on the sample size and, and other variables, but we won't worry about that for now. We've never seen in this course how to calculate 95% confidence intervals, but Copilot can do it for us, or at least we hope it can. So let's give it a try. Okay, calculate the... 95% CI, CI is short for confidence interval, for the mean RT across all participant ID is what it's suggesting. Nope, that's not what I want to do. For the mean RT for each participant ID. Accept that prompt, another line. Yeah. So it's going to do this in multiple steps, it looks like. So first it's saying it's going to calculate the mean RT for each participant ID. And so we get f.group by participant ID. So this is the same thing we saw before for calculating the mean. And that is, in fact, a first step that you need to do in order to calculate your confidence intervals. And it's going to store these values for each individual in the means variable. Uh, I don't really need it to print out the means. I just want it to go to the next step. Calculate the standard error of the mean for each participant ID. 
And again, this is another step that you need to do to compute confidence intervals. You might not know that, but you can hope that Copilot's doing the right thing. And of course, you should always cross-check against uh, other sources. So for example, once we're done this, you could do an internet search for, you know, formula for confidence intervals and see what it gives you and ensure that what Copilot's doing is correct. All right, so it's basically the same code, except instead of .mean at the end, it's .sem. It's going to give us next. It's going to say calculate the 95% CI for the mean RT for each participant ID. So now CIs equals SEMs times 1.96. And so that is indeed an important step towards the confidence interval, because it's basically that standard error multiplied by 1.96, which is the Z score or Z score corresponding to 95%, or conversely 5%, if you could think about it. Anyway, I don't actually want it to spit out the CIs there. Let's get rid of that. And oh, look at that. It's even going to put the means and CIs into a data frame for me. So the means equals means dot reset index. I won't worry about the reset index, but it's a good thing. So it's adding a column for confidence interval called CI, and it's plugging in the CIs for RT. Let's see what this gives us. And so means enter again and it even wants to plot the means in CIs. Well that's fun but that wasn't part of our instructions so let's run this cell and see what we get. So we have now a table for each participant ID so that's great. It shows us the mean reaction time and the confidence interval. This is good. The one thing that it's not doing is typically we report confidence intervals as a range and here you see there's just a single value. That range is really going to be basically that value plus or minus the mean but it would be nice to actually have the table do that rather than having to manually compute that. So let's go. I'm going to take this prompt again and I'm going to hit B, create a new cell below the current one, paste that in, and what do I want to do? Calculate the 95% CI. So instead of just saying the 95% CI, what I can say is calculate the upper and lower 95% CI. So let's be grammatically correct here. Let's see what it gives us. Okay, means lower equals means RT minus means CI. And this is cool because it's not reinventing the wheel. It's not regenerating code up above. It has the context. We already have this table called means and we're just gonna add things to it based on calculations computed on different columns within the existing table. Here we go. So now we have our same table as before, but two added columns that are the lower and upper bounds of the confidence interval. This is pretty cool, and this is actually unlike what you'll see in the textbook, because when I went through it before, just by using somewhat different prompts, same human brain, different day, different thoughts about how to phrase the prompts, I actually had more trouble, but I ended up getting through it. I'm quite happy with the series of prompts, so maybe I'm just getting better at writing prompts. Hopefully we all will if we're using Copilot. So anyway, I'm going to delete this cell Copilot chat to the rescue because I don't need it. We can cross-check Copilot's code with other sources, as I suggested. And if we do a web search for confidence interval formula, we find something like this. And this is actually written in Python code. So you can see that it's the mean plus 1.96 times standard deviation, is what STD stands for, divided by the square root of n. Now, if we look at our formula, it was in multiple parts, but we calculated standard error of the mean, not standard deviation, and multiplied those by 1.96. So we see the 1.96 is the same. If you don't know already, you could look it up, but the formula for the standard error of the mean is in fact standard deviation divided by the square root of n, n being the number of samples, number of data points you have. So in other words, Python just skipped a step and used the standard error of the mean method and then the upper and lower plus and minus. So anyway, we cross-checked, we confirmed Copilot's actually given us the right formula for confidence intervals, so that's great. And then finally in this lesson, we're gonna compute the 95% confidence intervals now across all participants rather than just within each participant. So calculate, and we'll include the learning from above that the upper and lower 95% CIs for the mean RT. So it's basically just regurgitating the previous prompt. 
over all participant ID. So it means lower dot mean. And again, it's using the context. This isn't the way we'd start if we hadn't computed the confidence intervals for each participant. But now it's just taking the mean upper confidence interval and the mean lower confidence interval. And now it's suggesting we plot the mean RT for each participant. That, again, is not part of our directions. Try it on your own if you want. We're going to get to plotting in a later chapter of this course. But let's just spit out the table means again. No, no, don't do that. Ah, okay. Let's dial it back to your outputs. I'm going to remove the code because I wasn't thinking. Hit enter again. Okay, so means lower dot mean, means upper dot mean. So this is kind of cool because it's seeing the previous context and saying, oh, we could just calculate the average or the mean across the existing columns for upper and lower confidence intervals. And okay, that's fine, fair enough. But one problem is that remember Jupyter Notebook cells only show the output of the last command that generated output. So this won't actually give us the output we want. So I'm going to delete that and add a line to the prompt and create a table showing the mean T and CIs, not for each participant ID, but across all participant ID. Okay, this doesn't look like it's going to work, but I'm going to let it go. data frame. Okay. Yeah, see, this really doesn't make sense. Hopefully you can figure out why, but basically each of these lines means rt.mean. It's just going to generate a number. It's not storing them into variables, and so it's useless. They're not ever going to get into a table because they're not being put into a table. And here it's taking the means table, and what's it going to do? Yeah, this is just garbage. Okay. So here we go. This is a nice example of Copilot not doing what we want it to do and us trying to figure out what we can do better. So this time when it suggested that first line of code, I hit option square bracket, which cycles between different Copilot suggestions. We can see this suggestion is to compute the mean overall, so the mean across the RT column in DF, and save it in a variable, which is, as I said, what we need. SEM overall, is that CI overall. So it's going through the same sort of sequence of steps to calculate the confidence intervals. And this time saving each one to a variable name. And then overall equals PD data frame. So we're going to create a data frame. And one way to define a data frame is as a set of dictionary entries. So each entry in the dictionary is going to be a column of the data frame. So here what we see, we see the purple curly braces there to open the dictionary. First column is going to be called mean, and it's going to contain mean overall. Second column is called lower, the last column is called upper. And we'll hit enter, and the last line will print that out. So let's run that. And sure enough, we get the mean and the lower and the upper confidence intervals. And these confidence intervals seem reasonable. The formula matches the formula we saw up above. But also, the lower confidence interval is somewhat lower than the mean, the upper is somewhat larger, and they're about an equal distance, so they're each about 0.02 away from the mean, and the CIs should be symmetrical. So that's awesome. We've seen how to do some stuff in Python that we didn't know how to do before, and we didn't have to learn how to write the code or look it up. We just had to learn how to use GitHub Copilot to do it, and also how to be a critical consumer of Copilot and double check that it is doing the right thing. So take a break and we're going to move on to lesson three. Okay, so in the textbook there's a third section to this lesson where we combine basically the two tables that we've just generated, but there's so little to it really that we're just going to do it in this same workbook and rather than copy over all the code and basically do what we're going to do now. Okay, so we've got these two tables. One is by participant and it's got these five columns. The other one is overall participants, and it's just got three columns. So the first thing we have to consider is when we want to combine these two tables, we want to combine, you know, as they say, apples and apples. 
So in other words, we want two tables that have the same columns, same names, that sort of thing. So here we have mean, lower and upper. In the individual participant one, the mean RTs are under the heading RT. So let's start by renaming that column to be the same in both the tables. So rename the RT column in means to mean RT. I'm actually going to say mean underscore RT. Get the code for that. It's basically just using a Python dictionary with the columns argument. And we can check that that worked right. We did. It's called the mean RT. And then rename the mean column in overall to mean RT. Copilot kind of figured out what I'm doing here. So that's great. Okay. Basically the same command. We can check that overall. Okay. So now we have mean RT is the same column name in both contains the same sort of information. Lower and upper are actually the same in both. The CI column in this one we don't need. So let's remove the CI column from means. So we've got means.drop columns and then the name of the column we want to drop. Look at means, confirm that worked, it did. So the final thing we need to consider is that the table that has the mean over all participants doesn't have a participant ID column because we didn't need one. We've only got one row there. But since we want to combine these two tables and we want to preserve the subject IDs or participant IDs for these rows, what we should do is create an extra column in the overall one called participant ID and give it a sensible label like mean. So let's say create a new column in overall called participant ID and set it to overall. Overall, I'm going to say set it to mean. So overall square bracket participant ID equals mean. And that's something you may remember from pandas is that to create a new column, you just have to reference it in kind of the normal way you would. In other words, the data frame name and then square brackets in the column name and just assign some value to it. So we've got overall, and now we have that. Okay, now one thing you'll notice is that participant ID is the leftmost column in the means table, the rightmost column in the overall table. But because pandas is going to match, when it merges these two, it's gonna match based on column names and not the column positions, this shouldn't be an issue. So now let's combine means and overall into one data frame. Thank you, Copilot. And what it gives us is means equals PD, pandas can cat, the two tables, and then ignore index equals true. When you're combining data frames, that's usually what you want to do because in this case, the indexes are just the row numbers and it's a little weird to have two indexes that are zero. That can confuse pandas unless we say to ignore the index. The other thing I'll note here is in the PD concat command, I need to move my mouse so you can see it, the first argument to concat should be all of the data frames that you want to combine together. And so in order to give it more than one value in one position in the PD concat command, so the first argument, you have to pack them inside a list. So you can see those purple square brackets there. Okay, so do that, spit it out, and Bob's your uncle. We've got each participant and then a label that clearly indicates the mean mean RTs and our upper and lower CIs. Probably be good practice to call those lower underscore CI and upper underscore CI. So let's put that kind of icing on the cake there. And oh, and it's suggesting we save the data frame. You can do that, but let's first rename the columns. So rename the lower, eh, actually that was a good suggestion, participant ID column to participant. So say we were gonna put this in a table in a report or a paper. Participant ID is kind of a weird label, participants more clear. So let's do that. I don't want to spit it out yet. I want to do what I originally wanted to do, which is rename the lower column in, what did we call it, means to not lower RT, but lower CI. It gives us the code for that. And it intuits the pattern that if I did that for the lower, I want to do it for the upper. Except that. And why not? Let's 
Oops, forgot to accept that. Just type in means, confirm that the table looks like what we want, and now save the means data frame to a CSV file called means.csv. Accept that, run it, and we get no output, but I'm going to pop open my file browser, and we can see, is it in the data file? No, it's in here we didn't specify to store it in the data folder. So that could be one last thing we want to do is we want to keep all our data in the data folder. So let's just replace that code to a CSV file called means.csv in the data subfolder. And by saying data subfolder, hopefully it'll know I mean the subfolder of where I am now. And yes, means to CSV just says data, not dot dot slash data or something else before data. And now you see means.csv pops up within the data folder. And in VS Code, I can right click on the means.csv file I don't want, and I can delete that. Move it to the trash. All right, so that brings an end to this lesson. I hope you got some more insight into how to use Copilot and think a little more about prompt engineering because that's really the key thing with Copilot. I guess the two key things are engineering prompts, thinking about your phrasing, and then the associated flip side of that is critically evaluating the code that is generated and the results that are generated to make sure it's doing the right thing and then figure out how to modify your prompts if you want to, if you need to, basically. Awesome. That's the end of this lesson. Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.